Welcome everyone to this evening's uh, lecture. We really appreciate your presence and it's very exciting for me to briefly uh, introduce and say a few words of gratitude before uh, the, the event of having Reverend Senator Warnock here to address us today. Uh, first of all, the words of gratitude. Uh, I would like to thank the Baptist Theological Union and the, the, the Virginia Union Seminary, whose efforts in partnership have made this event possible. And if possible, those members of the BTU here, please make yourself uh, shown. And representatives of Virginia Union, please make yourself uh, known as well. And I would also like to thank the Martin Marty Center of the University of Chicago for providing the administrative support, and especially the Marty Center's executive director, Brie Loscota, Brie Loscota, for her tireless efforts in making this event possible. Uh, thanks are also to the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice for providing additional administrative support. So thanks very much to the Crown School. <laughs> and before introducing Marshall Hatch, in just a moment, I'd like to call up for just a, a moment of, of uh, presence um, the uh, Reverend Dr. Reginald Williams, Jr., who is senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of University Park. Uh, Reverend Dr. Williams is a graduate of Virginia Union, and would you please uh, uh, stand up and, and uh, say a few words just addressing the audience from Virginia Union's perspective. Good afternoon. What a joy it is to be here today. Uh, I rise to represent uh, the Sammy DeWitt Proctor uh, Conference, where Dr. Ivor Carruthers is the general chairperson, and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology, uh, where our dean is Dr. John Eric Guns. Uh, it is a privilege to be here, um, not only because of Dr. Senator uh, Raphael Warnock, but the collaboration and connection between University of Chicago and Virginia Union, as you can see uh, in your bulletin. Virginia Union is a school uh, that began as in a space of incarceration out of Mary Lumpkin's jail. And out of that space of incarceration came um, an institution of education that would transform the lives of those uh, formerly enslaved Africans uh, to engage in transformation uh, across this country. And so we are grateful to be here and to be in connection with the Div School here at University of Chicago, uh, and we look forward uh, to not only being here, uh, but to this coming to Virginia Union as well, uh, as we look forward to spreading uh, these types of pieces around uh, the country and at other HBCUs. I'm also a graduate of Florida A&M University. Um, and so being uh, glad to be here, glad to represent our dean, uh, and glad to um, get all that we can from uh, Dr. Senator Warnock. God bless you, glad to have, be here. And finally, I would like to introduce the Reverend Dr. Marshall Hatch Sr., uh, who will introduce the senator. Um, um, Reverend Dr. Marshall Hatch is a longtime trustee of the Baptist Theological Union, an alum of McCormick Theological Seminary where he received his master's and PhD and he has been the pastor of New Mount Pilgrim Missionary Baptist since 1993. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Hatch was a Merrill Fellow at Harvard, uh, received degrees from Georgetown and McCormick, as, as mentioned, and most recently is, is one of the lead directors of the Mafia Redemption Project, which will soon be featured in a film, All the Sons. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Reverend Dr. Hatch. Thank you, Dean Robinson, and of course, we again salute all of the trustees of the Baptist Theological Union. 
So when you hear BTU, that's what that means. That means it. <laughs> it's like MB Church Missionary Baptist. You have to sometime spell it out. But uh, we're delighted to always welcome the presence of our iconic civil rights leader, mentor, the one and only Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson is in the house. And thank you for your presence, Reverend Jackson. To say that the Reverend Senator Raphael G. Warnock has had an impactful ministry is a gross understatement. In light of the profound ways that his ministry has propelled him into places and spaces that intersect personal faith and public service and public life, his life and ministry has been wondrous to behold. Since, 19, since 2005, he has served as senior pastor of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, carrying on the, link, the King legacy with grace and distinction. With preparation as a student at Morehouse College, where he received his BA, and furthering his preparation at Union Theological Seminary, where he received his Masters of Divinity, his Masters of Philosophy, his PhD, I dare say under the tutelage of the late Dr. James Hal Cohn. He is now a public theologian whose landmark work, Divided Mind of the Black Church, crystallizes black church history and the evolution of black theologies and projects for the 21st century a church whose prophetic vision as a church born out of slavery calls for universal human rights as a thrust of its ministry and its contribution globally. Dr. Warnock has been a prophetic voice bursting onto the scene of public life in Georgia as an advocate for Medicare expansion and calling for health care as a universal human right. In 2020, Dr. Warnock emerged as a political actor, winning partial and then full terms as the first African-American Democratic United States Senator from the Deep South. And with that ground-shaking political work, he singularly helped create a Senate majority for progressive public policy. Above all, he continues to fulfill his calling in the pulpit as a passionate and prodigious gospel preacher. And all of us who preach would say that's the highest calling. <laughs> but as is in the scripture, 1 John 3 and 2, I must say, it doeth not yet appear what he shall be. All of this from the humble beginnings as the son of a Pentecostal, of Pentecostal preachers, son of Savannah, Georgia, growing up in public housing, we could not have secured a more appropriate voice for this re-inaugural present, presentation of the Culver Lecture Series on the integration of faith and public life. And so now let us welcome the junior senator from the great state of Georgia, United States Senator, the Reverend Dr. Raphael Gamaliel Warnock. And the church said amen. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you so very much. In this room is warm in Chicago. Thank you for your spirit, for that very kind and magnanimous introduction. Wonderful to be here among so many friends. I'll get in trouble if I start naming all the preachers and teachers and 
professors I know in this room. But once again, in a real sense, our icon, patriarch, somebody I grew up looking up to, and um, that all of these years later, I'm able to say I, I know the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson. <laughs> Give him a great big round of applause. Let's see. His son and my colleague Jonathan is in the house. Congressman Jackson, let's hear for Congressman Jackson. Thank you. Grateful uh, to all the leaders who are here. I would like to welcome and publicly congratulate uh, someone, you know, I'm pastor of Ebenezer Church, junior United States Senator from Georgia. I have another proud distinction. I'm Brad Braxton's successor at the Douglas Memorial Community Church in Baltimore, Maryland. We both served that church. I came after him, right after him. He's the new president of the Chicago Theological Seminary. Bless you, brother. I have to acknowledge that lineage. Reggie Williams, Dr. Proctor would be proud. Thank you so much for this kind uh, invitation. As I thought about the Culver Lecture and the reinauguration of this lecture series and all that that legacy represents, this bold abolitionist and leading light for freedom during tough times out of which the legacy of Virginia Union Springs, the Baptist Theological Union. I wanna talk in that spirit from this title, Let My People Go. The scandal of mass incarceration in the land of the free. 55 years ago this month, Martin Luther King Jr. took his last stand for freedom. In a very real sense, he was summoned to Memphis by the sacrifice of two sanitation workers, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, who were literally, literally crushed to death in the back of a trash truck where they sought shelter from a storm. They were there because sanitation workers were prohibited from riding in the truck with their white counterparts. And so viewed as disposable refuse, they could only ride on the back of the truck or in the compactor area. And in a country where we too often tell ourselves a simple story, even about the Civil Rights Movement, I want you to observe that this is 1968, four years after the Civil Rights Law of 1964 with its integration of public accommodations. Three years after the Voting Rights Act, they were seeking shelter from a storm, but there was no shelter from the rains and the storm of white supremacy. And so the black bodies of Echo Cole and Robert Walker were crushed and killed by the vicious machinery of Jim Crow segregation. Yet tragically, it was these crushed black bodies, the latest blow in a long pattern of neglect and abuse that finally gave fuel to the fledgling Memphis movement triggering the radical spirit and action of the local black churches and producing those historic and iconic signs, I am a man. Here's how you know when you are an oppressed people, when you have to have a movement or make signs or have a campaign to declare about yourself that which ought to be obvious. 
I can think of nothing more sublime. Nothing more basic. I can think of no more humble assertion than to simply say, I am a man. Or in the case of Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman? Or in more recent days, Black Lives Matter. 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 Those who retort know all lives matter manifestly miss the point. It is oppression itself that makes necessary movements to affirm the truth of what ought to be obvious. And one of the biggest obstacles to genuine human community is a glib, unreflective, and uncritical universalism. Justice demands the honest recognition that not all lives are imperiled in the same way. That's what summoned Dr. King to Memphis. He was there to stand with those who needed a movement. A little over two months later, he would be slain by an assassin's bullet on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. His last book published a year later was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? I ask this afternoon, this evening, where indeed? Specifically, 55 years after the Memphis Movement and the Poor People's Campaign, where are the places that poor bodies and black bodies and brown bodies are being crushed by the machinery of the state or the society at large demanding the attention of the church and the larger community? Well, while recognizing the structural complexity of racism and its inextricable link to and participation with other constituent parts of hegemonic power, including sexism, classism, and militarism, I would argue that today, mass incarceration is Jim Crow's most obvious descendant. And like its ancestor, its dismantling would honor the Cova legacy, would represent both massive social and infrastructural transformation and immeasurable power in a society still steeped in the ideology of white supremacy. The ideology of white supremacy has created the massive in infrastructure of the American carceral state. And I argue that this massive privatized infrastructure, the carceral state, has in turn constructed its own distinct ideology. The infrastructure has created an ideology that has a life on his, of its own. And it is this ideology, the distorted fear-based logic of the carceral state and its construal of blackness as dangerousness and guilt that imperils all of us, but especially black bodies during routine traffic stops, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, while running in the rain through one's own community, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, while playing in a park, 12-year-old Tamir Rice, while eating ice cream or playing with family members in the sanctuary of one's own home, Botham Jean, Atiana Jefferson, more recently, Tyree Nichols, beaten by a gang of black police officers. Same sickness. Don't be confused by phenotype, the sickness is the same. I would argue that 16-year-old Ralph Yarl who was shot in the head by an 84-year-old who spends all day watching Fox News, listening to conservative television, radio. I would argue that 16-year-old Ralph Yarl, in many ways, a model of a kid, is like too many black men, a victim of the carceral state. rang the wrong doorbell, snatched by the tentacles that have hollowed out entire black communities.
I submit that at root, this is a spiritual problem. Which is why we ought to be dealing with it in seminary. It is, it is not just a political problem, but it is symptomatic of a sickness in the body politic. And here again, Dr. King and those who marched alongside him helps us because I'm always struck by the fact that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference's motto was not to end segregation in America. That was their goal. It was not to secure voting rights. Their motto was not to secure civil rights. Their motto was to redeem the soul of America. And yet again, it is the soul of America that is, again, that is in trouble. The United States of America, the land of the free, is by far, by far, by far, mass incarceration capital of the world. Think about that, the land of the free, mass incarceration of the world. Shining city on this hill shackles more people than any land in the world. Nobody even comes close in the rates of incarceration or even in the sheer numbers of people incarcerated. It is a scandal and a scar on the soul of America that we are a nation that comprises 4% of the world's population and warehouses nearly 25% of the world's, population, world's prison population is a scandal and a scar on the soul of America. That we lock up people awaiting trial and keep them there for weeks and months and years. Remember Khalif Browder? Not because they pose a threat to society, but because they cannot afford to pay a bail bond is a scandal and a scar on the soul of America. That we criminalize poverty and penalize people for being poor is a scandal and a scar on the soul of America, that we have a greater percentage of our black population in jails and prisons than did South Africa at the height of apartheid is a scandal and a scar on the soul of America, that in all of our large American cities, as many as half of the young black men are caught up somewhere in the matrix and social control of the criminal justice system, and that black men have been banished from our families, devastating generations of our families, it's a scandal and a scar on the soul of America. These men, and increasingly women, then come out carrying the mark and the stigma of convicted felon or ex-felon, and are therefore confronted with all of the legalized barriers against which Martin Luther King Jr. and Jesse Jackson and others fought in the old Jim Crow. Housing discrimination, legal. Employment discrimination, because you have the mark felon, may have taken a plea, may have spent no considerable time in jail, legal. Barred from voting, some professional licenses. In some states like mine, even the license to be a barber. Public benefits, student loans, And most of the black men in America's jails and prisons today are charged with nonviolent drug-related offenses. They are casualties in America's war on drugs. At least it was a war when the drug was cracked and the bodies were black and brown in places like Detroit, Baltimore, the South Side of Chicago, South Central LA, and certain communities in Atlanta. We had a war yeah. on drugs. Now that we are talking about opioids, it even sounds nicer. <laughs> and meth. And the faces of the human tragedy are white and suburban. Suddenly we have a public health emergency. Two very different responses to the same problem. Public health emergencies are addressed through doctors, public health officials, social workers, therapists, and clinics. Wars are prosecuted against enemy combatants who are either killed or become prisoners of war.
The data shows that black people and white people use and sell drugs at remarkably similar rates. We're all entitled to our own opinion, not our own facts. Black people and white people use and sell drugs at remarkably similar rates. Yet black people are 12% of the general population, over 50% of the prison population. And that's why Michelle Alexander has persuasively argued that the mass incarceration of tens of thousands of black bodies for nonviolent drug-related offenses and the long consequences that result are constituent parts of the new Jim Crow. Legally barred from the doors of entry to citizenship, symbolized in the right to vote and denied access to ladders of opportunity and social upward mobility, she observes that those who have served their time in America's prisons or who plead guilty in exchange for little or no actual prison time are not part of a class but a permanent caste system. I agree. And in theological terms, in theological, uh, in theological terms, I submit that they are condemned to what I call eternal social damnation. Even in the face of heroic efforts to carve for oneself a path of redemption, ours is an exceedingly punitive system that routinely produces political pariahs and economic lepers. Condemned in a very, very real sense to check a box on applications for employment and other applications reminiscent of the ancient biblical stigma, unclean. There is no clear example of America's unfinished business with the project of racial justice than the 21st century caste system engendered by its prison industrial complex. Moreover, I submit that there is no more significant scandal belying the moral credibility of the American churches than their conspicuous silence as this human catastrophe has unfolded now for more than four decades. To be sure, scores of American churches have prison ministries, and some even have reclamation ministries for returning citizens. But there is a vast difference between offering pastoral care and spiritual guidance to the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated and challenging in an organized way the public policies, laws, and policing practices that lead to the disproportionate incarceration of people of color in the first place. That, that is the work of justice. And so I came just to suggest that we need a national, multi-faith, multi-racial movement to end the scourge of mass incarceration. The insatiable beast whose massive tentacles place black children in chokeholds and brown babies in cages on both sides of the border. But here's the problem. How do you build an effective social movement, particularly among church folk, when the primary subjects of its advocacy are those stigmatized by the pejorative label illegals in the case of our Latinx, Latinx sisters and brothers, subjected to draconian tactics of immigration enforcement, whether they are citizens or not? How do you win public sympathy and support for convicted felons? It is one thing to stand up for Rosa Parks, who Martin Luther King Jr. called one of the most respected people in the Negro community. It is quite another to fight for the basic human dignity of persons whose entire humanity has been supplanted by a legal and moral stigma. And in many instances, they may well bear real culpability for their condition. 
Indeed, this is part of the conundrum posed by racial bias in the criminal justice system. In a world where ordinary black people must still navigate every day the racial politics of respectability, bearing the burden of being in the words of that old folk saying, a credit to the race. That's what they said during my dad's times. Be a credit to the race. I sometimes wonder if people think Donald Trump is a credit. <laughs> well, <laughs> but there's a sense even in the black community that these folk have not kept their side of the deal. If many outside of the African-American community view these young black men who track through the courtrooms of every major American city every single day with fear and contempt, many within their own families and churches harbor feelings of disappointment, anger, and ambivalence. They are the ultimate outsiders, stigmatized for life as both black and criminal, two words that have long been interchangeable in the Western moral imagination. 400 years after the arrival of more than 20 enslaved Africans in Jamestown, Virginia, the black body remains the central text in the narrative of a complicated story called America. For all who would understand who we Americans are and how we have arrived, the black body is essential reading. There is no American wealth without reference to black people. Yet the black body is viewed essentially as a problem, sitting at the center of what Guna Myrtle characterized in 1944 as an American dilemma. 400 years later, formerly enslaved black bodies and branded black bodies and lynched black bodies and raped black bodies and segregated black bodies are now stopped, frisked, groped, searched, handcuffed, incarcerated, paroled, probated, released, but never emancipated black bodies. Like many, I have witnessed the human cost of this story and stigma as a pastor, and I have witnessed it personally in my own family. I was struck that 60 days or so after I announced my candidacy for the United States Senate, as we found ourselves 30 days after my announcement in the throes of a pandemic, COVID-19, that weeks after that, we would be confronted again with the reemergence of another pandemic, COVID-16-19. Lynching of George Floyd, mm -hmm. out of which a multiracial coalition of conscience poured out into American streets. But once we could not turn away. Sometime thereafter, there was Another tragedy, a young man named Rayshard Brooks was killed by Atlanta police. He had fallen asleep in the parking lot of Wendy's. They had had a conversation, he and the officers, for nearly an hour where he decided to run. He was in Georgia's parole and probation system, which is longer than almost any in the country. Some say, well, why did he run? Maybe he would be alive. Well, here's the dilemma for black parents. Rayshard Brooks ran and he's dead. George Floyd did not run and he's dead. So what do we tell our children? 
I eulogized Ray Shard Brooks. And then I got up in the wee hours of the next morning before sunrise to drive down to South Georgia to pick up my brother. He was standing outside of the prison with a sack carrying all of his belongings. Here I was running for the United States Senate. I used to sleep on the top bunk. He slept on the bottom bunk. There he was standing there on the sidewalk with all of his belongings, standing outside to get in my car for the first time in 22 years. He was convicted in a drug sting, first time offender, situation in which no one was killed, no one was physically hurt, wait for it, no drugs ever even hit the street. Crime scenario created by the state. For that, he was sentenced to life in federal prison without the possibility of parole. And the only reason he was coming out that day, 22 years later, was because of COVID-19. Day three years later, he's outside, but still under control. But no group is more stigmatized than those persons on death row. By the time I um, met Troy Davis and became involved with his case, both as pastor to him and his family and as a public advocate for the sparing of his life. He had been de on death row for nearly 20 years, convicted in 1991 for the 1989 slaying of Savannah, Georgia police officer Mark Allen McPhail. 2008, and we held the first of several rallies for him at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Davis's case had already gained national and international attention and brought together unlikely allies in the struggle to save his life. There was so much doubt surrounding this case that on separate occasions, Davis's execution was stayed within minutes of his death. One fall afternoon, I sat in a pastoral visit at his cell as he reflected on his life, its meaning and his hope that somehow his story might be a bridge to a better future and a larger good. We talked. We prayed, we sat silently, we said goodbye. Two days later, I stood in a prison yard where his family and hundreds of others, one fall night, September 21st, 2011, as Troy Davis was stretched out and strapped to a gurney, bearing an er eerie resemblance to a crucifix and executed in my name as a citizen of the state of Georgia by lethal injection. In the years that I have continued to fight for Davis and others like him for the soul and for the soul of a nation scarred by the scandal of mass incarceration and the lives of young black men like Trayvon Martin, who was tragically endangered and murdered by the stigma of blackness as criminality, I have often reminded myself that I preach each week in memory of a death row inmate convicted on trumped up charges at the behest of religious authorities and executed by the state without the benefit of due process. The cross, the Roman Empire's method of execution reserved for subversives is a symbol of stigma and shame. Yet the early followers of Jesus embraced the scandal of the cross calling it the power of God. To tell that story is to tell the story of stigmatized human beings. 
To embrace the cross is to bear witness to the truth and power of God, subverting human assumptions about truth and power, pointing beyond the tragic limits of a given moment toward the promise of the resurrection. It is to see what an imprisoned exile of a persecuted community saw as he captured in scripture the vision and hope of a new heaven and a new earth. And so this is why Ebenezer Baptist Church has been trying to find a way to faithfully and effectively bear witness to God's justice. A few years ago, we organized a national multiracial multi-faith conference focused on the collective work of dismantling mass incarceration by catalyzing the resources of people of faith and moral courage in a movement that operates at the local, state, and national level. We are now at work, and we have four major objectives. One, to train and equip pastors, rabbis, and imams, and other faith leaders and their teams with practical tools for addressing their ministries to mass incarceration as a social justice issue. Two, to identify and coalesce around a strategic legislative agenda. I can now help with that. At the local, state, and national levels. Three, to organize an interfaith network of partners focused on abolishing mass incarceration. And four, to lay the groundwork for the development of a new media strategy for reframing the public understanding of the prison industrial complex and its implications for public safety, quality, and quality of life. We who are people of faith, we who preach every Sunday in memory of that death row inmate, are uniquely situated to utilize our institutional power and the grand symbols of our tradition to address stigma the way Jesus did. Much of our work has been centered around expungements. In 2016, we came together with other county officials to organize and host our very first expungement clinic, a one-stop shop in the church's banquet hall that cleared the arrest records of hundreds of citizens who had been arrested but never convicted. Yet, like millions of Americans who have arrest records, they were either barred or limited in their employment options, rejected in their applications for housing, apartments, and other features of a prosperous and dignified life. We continue these expungement events, and they have been emancipation moments for people looking for a second chance. I remember the very first one and I remember the joy I felt as I walked into our sanctuary one Saturday morning and realized that everyone gathered that day in church had a record. But then I thought to myself that in a real sense, that's true every Sunday. Everybody in church has a record. None of us wants to be forever judged by our worst moment. And each of us has some record that cries out for grace and redemption. And sometime after the first event, I was sitting in the chair at the barbershop. Believe it or not, true story. I was sitting in the chair. <laughs> at the barbershop. And my barber was finishing, shaping up my goatee. <laughs> and I was rushing to get out of the chair to my next appointment when another patron walked up to me. He said, Rev, that was a great event y'all had. I said, what event? He said, the expungement event. I politely said, thank you. And I was trying to get to my next appointment. He said, Rev, wait. You don't understand. You cleared my record. I stood there, looked at him. He was a middle-aged man. 
well-dressed, well-spoken, respectable. I had to examine my own assumptions. You cleared my record. Something about a bad check 20 years ago, never convicted. He said, you cleared my record, and as a result, I've got a better job, my income has gone up, and my life is better. I congratulated him, I shook his hand, and I was headed for the door when he said, Red, wait! <laughs> a young couple in my family had a baby that they did not have the means to raise. Family member. The baby was headed to foster care. But became, because I came to church, somebody cleared my record. I was able to do what I would not have been able to do. I was able to adopt my own family member. The trajectory of two generations changed by one stroke of grace. I'm glad, but I'm also sad and I'm mad because he had never been convicted of anything. He had an arrest record. He was free, yet for 20 years he had been bound by the massive tentacles of our prison industrial complex while helping people like him, it is that fundamental problem that we seek to address in a nation where nearly 30% of adults has a record in America. So now we are working with others to address this. People of faith and moral courage should lead the charge. It is the fear-based logic of the carceral state that is killing people, black and white citizens. We're all armed to the hilt, afraid of one another. We've seen in recent days, it's dangerous. Ring the wrong doorbell, go in the wrong driveway. That is why people of faith must lead this charge. We must say to a failed fear-based system, let my people go. That is what God told Moses to tell Pharaoh. Let my people go that they may worship me. Liberate them from human bondage so that they might blossom and live lives of human flourishing. Lives that give glory to God rather than the human systems. Moses had a speech impediment, yet God picked him. Moses had a record. Yeah, God picked him. Or maybe God picked him because he had a record. God has a record of using people with a record. <laughs> Moses had a record. He slew an Egyptian. He killed a man. God had more in store for him. Joseph had a record long before a Central Park case and a ruthless prosecutor. Long before Donald Trump's op-ed, throw them in the jail, there was Potiphar's wife. Joseph was thrown in prison, but he held on to his dreams. The three Hebrew boys had a record, and they were sentenced to death for an act of civil disobedience. Daniel was charged, convicted, and thrown in the lion's den. John was imprisoned on an island called Patmos, the Rikers Island of that day. And there he saw a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus had a record. Not surprising, given his start. Of course he had a record. Look at the neighborhood he was born in. <laughs> born in a barrio called Bethlehem. Smuggled as an undocumented immigrant into Egypt, raised in a ghetto called Nazareth. But he came saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to open the eyes of the blind, to preach liberty to those in captivity. They brought him up on trumped up charges. and They convicted him without the benefit of due process. They marched him up Golgotha's hill and executed him on a Roman cross, buried him in a borrowed tomb. But he was so powerful, 
that he turned the scandal of the cross in, into an enduring symbol of victory over evil and injustice. And his movement was so contagious that he got off the cross and got in our hearts. He is my redeemer and liberator. And in his name and in the name of all that is good and justice and righteous and true, we who are people of faith must stand together once again, redeem the soul of America, and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. The senator went much further in the um, articulation of the good news than we thought you would. <laughs> I'm still a Baptist preacher. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to say, I, I watch you most Sundays, so I'm not surprised <laughs> that you went all the way there. But it is interesting, out of all of the things that you could have talked about, and th th this was a wide um, latitude that you had yep. and interestingly the subject matter that you chose this group this you know the, the ex-offenders or either the folk who have been somehow given this mark uh, and made outsiders mm. out of all of the things you could have chosen to talk about you chose that and I think you talked a little bit about your personal experience uh, with your family, which is why it matters who sits in these seats and what kind of experiences it, that they have. Mm -hmm. And you also, I think, challenged us as people of faith because every weekend in the Abrahamic traditions, uh, we lift up sacrifice and at some point we, um, we highlight redemption another start, a new chance, mm -hmm. a clean record. And so uh, I, I think that appropriately, the place that we can really start a movement to address what harms so many people in communities like the one I pastor in, our project is the Marfa Redemption Project. Um, what kind of traction are you finding? Because you really, you outlined a path forward and one of the things we would ask you uh, would be where do we go from here I think you already told us that that you know you've outlined what kind of traction are you finding in the faith communities for this issue in particular that I think is miraculous that a, that a, a United States senator is even highlighting this issue because I imagine you might be one out of a hundred literally <laughs> who thinks this is important enough to be the number one piece you would talk about on the road. So what kind of traction, what, are we making progress in yeah. recruiting people of faith? Well, I decided to talk about this uh, because it's something that I've been thinking about and working on for a long time. Um, I actually decided uh, years before I came to serve in the Senate, that when asked to preach or speak anywhere, whatever I talked about, I was gonna raise this issue. Might not, even, might not be the subject, but I made a covenant. <laughs> I made a covenant with God that, that when I spoke publicly, outside of my pulpit, because they hear it all the time, that I was gonna talk, I was gonna at least raise this issue. Yes. Because, and I, I don't know if I said it clearly or not, uh, clearly enough or not. I, I think that when you look at the legacy of 1619 and our ongoing struggle, America, the land that is and yet never was, to be who we say we are, th this, this, this is as central a moral issue among domestic issues as any. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a lens through which to address a whole range of other issues that you might be concerned about. So what about poverty, a whole range? This, this mass incarceration piece. And I do think the silence, the deafening silence of the American churches, all of them, uh, is, is reminiscent of, is akin to being silent during abolition. or during segregation. Um, you know, I'm a post-civil rights generation baby. I was born a year after Dr. King's death. And one of the things that amazes me is that um, almost everybody I know, especially black people, but almost, almost everybody I know over 65 marched with Dr. King. Yeah. <laughs> 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 there are not enough streets in America for the people. <laughs> and I'm uniquely situated to know this because, you know, as a pastor of the church, people, you know, I get that constantly. People sort of like they want me to know they're bona fide. So they, their connection to Dr. King. Why is that? It's because we now have the benefit of hindsight. And, you can, and we have moral clarity about something, believe it or not, that wasn't all that clear hmm. on that side of it. Right? And it manifested itself in various ways. Church people saying, oh, you know, change will come, just pray about it. Other folks saying, why is he doing all of that? He's, he's breaking the law. So we're clear now, sort of, right? And so I think, I think, I think like a whole range of things. There's some other things too, you know, uh, like our homophobia. And I, you know, we, we're gonna be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be embarrassed years from now by our silence. We got to ask ourselves, what are we going to say when our grandchildren ask, what were you doing while this human catastrophe was unfolding? Like, nobody comes close to our record. Nobody. I want you to think about all the regimes whose human rights records we love to deplore. Yeah, I'm saying it, United States Senator. They, nobody comes close. So the question, so I, I, I think, so I'm trying to call us to movement and we've launched something called the Ending Mass Incarceration uh, Program at, our, at my church. You can find us online. Um, we had this conference back in 2019 and um, I was very happy that it, it was a great turnout, it was national. There was racial parity at the conference. I was so glad to see that. It was like equal numbers of white people and people of color multi uh, uh, faith and we came and we put together a toolkit to help churches get involved locally whether it's through expungement events or media campaigns give people tools to respond to these issues legally uh, locally and we continue to do this work that was in the spring of 2019 this is how the Lord works can I say that at the University of Chicago <laughs> this, is how, this is how the Lord works I had no idea that a year later I'd be running for the Senate. Less than a year later. Hmm. Um, and they got footage of me saying, let my people go, and they ran ads saying, he wanna let everybody out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I still won five times. Uh, uh, <laughs> five times. I did. I mean, five, five, five times. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not willing to. So, so I, I, I am. I, my effort is to bring that to this new lane of my work as well. And um, 
because when I launched the EMI, I was trying to lobby for policy. Now I can actually write it. Mm -hmm. And um, I want you to join us in that work. Thank you, Senator. They're yanking our chain over there. Yep. And, um, yep. But I think we got two minutes. All right, yes. And I have to just say this again. We met once before. You may not remember. You were here for a fundraiser. Yeah, we were together a few. I remember. That's right. And I and I told of course I, remember. I told the jet. senator then. <laughs> I did that too. Yeah. I done done what the Lord told me to do. <laughs> but I, I I shared with you that I candidated for <laughs> Ebenezer at the same time Why you, you did. Why I got I got to break it up. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why 17 gonna, years ago, why are you I break? was a candidate. <laughs> and my testimony is I have the rejection letter <laughs> from the chairman of the committee to prove they got the right man. <laughs> <laughs> The Reverend Senator Raphael <laughs> D'Amelio Warnock. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Warnock, for your powerful message. This evening was conceived as the revitalization of the Nathaniel Culver Lecture at the University of Chicago Divinity School as part of a collaboration with Virginia Union and other educational institutions that also look back to Dr. Culver. With a named lecture, one hopes that the lecturer honors a particular past in such a way that it directs the audience toward a glimpsed and provocative future. Senator Warnock has met and exceeded that hope this evening. Nathaniel Culver was an antebellum prophet who grasped such an awful need for change in the United States that he could not wait for the map to be drawn or the way to be paved. Nor was he willing to simply preach, but rolled up his sleeves, moving from one location to the next, continually creating the change that in his mind's eye he could see and in his heart feel. Culver accomplished this through intellectual rigor, oratory skill, passionate listening, and spirited debate. As we have heard tonight, we are far enough along the path discerned by Dr. Culver's bold abolitionism and the great civil rights prophets who inspired him and who came after him, that there are yet again some who would become hardened and habituated, and even those who would attempt to turn us all back. But what may be most amazing about the prophetic imagination in the face of opposition and apathy is not its passion or its righteous indignation, but its creative restlessness, its insistence that we be fully present, deeply inquiring and urgently seeking a better future. So we understand that Senator Warnock was the perfect person to re-inaugurate and revitalize the Culver Lectures. We have been reminded that education and service are yoked, that social change requires spiritual struggle, and that public ministry necessarily moves beyond the walls of church, academy, and government into the world. Senator Warnock, thank you for your esteemed presence here with us tonight and your words. Thank you all for being here tonight.